with regard to the jambalaya challenge, um, as of 4.45 today, 238 fish were caught and registered. And I counted, and this is close, 28 different people had registered fish. So, um, I, we've already mentioned that uh, Mr. Patrick Banks was the assistant secretary is uh, providing a welcome mat for us and all of the beautiful decorations, but, but <laughs> it's actually Miss Melissa who has the handle on it. His associate Melissa is back here too. Everybody needs to know about Melissa. Yes, she does indeed. a lot of work for them. Grateful. We're grateful. Thank you. Um, but. Ken, are you ready? And we'll sure. do some gar fishing. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, fly fishing for gar has become somewhat of a, a little bit of an obsession of mine. Um, I'll kind of walk you through the whole story of how it came about, um, how, I, how it came about, and then how it became like this quest to, to crack the code to it, where it's not just, hey, there might be a garfish here. Let's go see, maybe if we can catch it. It became a, I'm gonna go anywhere and know how to catch them wherever they are. Um, so it really, for me, it all started with spotted bass. So I live in St. Francisville and in 2015, my kids were finally old enough that I could get back to, back into fishing some and all that. So I bought a boat with the intention of uh, I'm gonna go red fishing in the marsh like everyone wants to do. And, um, and then when I can't go there, the boat launch is just three miles down the road into the Mississippi River. I can run up by Sarah and go spotted bass fishing, which I did and you know continue to do to this day. But what I noticed is as you would go through the mouth of Bayou Sarah coming out of the Mississippi River, there would be about 10,000 rolling gar of, from everywhere, from this big to this big, just all over the place. And I would just be motoring right past all these big fish. And I was like, wow, why am I passing up all these big fish? I wonder if you can catch them. So I did what any true fisherman would do. I got on the interwebs on YouTube and looked it up. And it's, it's not like a whole lot of fly fishing for gar stuff. Everything you're gonna find pretty much is all gonna focus on tying a piece of rope on and throwing it out there and, and flossing them. So I was like, oh, okay, that's how you do it. So I tied a piece of rope on a shank, went out there the next day, pulled up to this log in the bayou and a, a gar rolled right there. And I was like, oh, there's one there. So I cast up into that log Stripped it twice, and next thing I know, I'm, I'm hooked up on this big old gar. It was probably a long nose gar about that size, jumping out of the water all crazy. Uh, got it all the way to the boat, and then I was like, well, <laughs> what am I going to do now? You know, it's all these teeth and stuff. I didn't even have a net with me. And uh, about that time, it untangled itself out of all this rope mess and <clears throat> got off and swam away. So I was like, Oh, this is easy. This will be fun. I'll just come out here whenever I want, you know, and catch a 10 pound fish all day long. And that was when poof, went off the cliff and realized that it really wasn't that easy. It was just beginner's, beginner's luck. So we'll get more into that. Um, if you didn't know, there's seven species of gar. Most of them, they're all in this side of the world. Uh, four of them live um, right here in Louisiana. The, uh, the other three, one of them is a Cuban gar, that's the top one. I think you got to go to Cuba to get that. Uh, the tropical gar is the next one. It's probably down in Central America somewhere. And then you got the long nose, the short nose, the spotted, and then the very bottom, the alligator gar. So those are what we got in Louisiana that Second from the bottom is a Florida gar, which is kind of like an alligator garish, spotted gar kind of combo that you would have to go the Florida way to find. So in Louisiana, I've kind of called it the Louisiana gar slam because you got these four species. It looks like they'd be really easy to tell apart. Um, 
And like an alligator gar is real easy to identify when it's five feet long and has the big head that looks like an alligator. But when they're all young ones, you know, in the 24, 30 inch range, they look a lot alike. But the spotted and the short nose and the alligator can actually be pretty difficult to tell apart. Um, the way you do it is you pry open the mouth of the alligator gar and you'll have two rows of teeth on the top jaw. That's kind of a, a giveaway for them. So characteristics of a gar, they're all long and they got that uh, the dorsal fin is way in the back there. They got teeth and um, they got ganoid scales which are this kind of big thick scales and their skin's really thick too. It's kind of an interesting fish when you when you handle one if you've never held one before. It's not quite like any other fish you've ever held. So of the four, this is just to demonstrate why you might be living in the best gar fishing place in the world. Um, this is the alligator gar. Um, this is one on display at the Old River Land and up there at Rackets the Old River. It, was the little plaque for it said it was a 140 pound one. Um, you know, you can see the range is pretty much East Texas, uh, Louisiana, and up kind of a little bit through the Red River Valley. Um, so it's not, a, and kind of along the Gulf Coast a little bit. So it's, it's a pretty small range and it's shrunk a lot from its historic range with damming and, and other, other um, challenges to their populations. Though in Louisiana, it's a, it's a common fish. Um, I think this old man was kind of long arming it for the camera. I've studied this picture carefully. And uh, I think it's real. Yeah, you know, I look at it like, that. Nah, it's not real, but no, I think it is. Um, you know where it's from? So no, I don't. Yeah. Do you? No. Okay. <laughs> the long nosed gar is the most widely distributed species. Um, it's all over the. Uh, from Louisiana all the way up to Canada, kind of along the Midwest, some of the East Coast. Um, this is a friend of mine, uh, Jenny Daniel's wife, who's here tonight um, with a real healthy, real healthy long nose gar that she caught on fly. Um, the story behind this is this is a little spot I got that is a code name Gar Alley. Um, normally the water clarity is maybe like. 16 inches tops um, and it's d directly affected by the rise and fall of the Mississippi River. Well I just so happened to catch it around 4th of July 2021 where the river had hit like a, I'll just call it a slack tide and the drainage going into Gar Alley, it, it all stopped and it clarified and it all turned into black water if you know what I mean. Like that swamp clear black water and I, I got into the alley and you could just see the gar all over the place they're just lined up and it was just sight fish sight casting to them and just popping them left and right and so I did that all morning and I called my buddy Daniel and I said hey if you want to go gar fishing you need to um, go hit the alley right now it's turned into black water so that afternoon I get a text message and you know, I had been catching gar like that. And I get this picture come in. And I think that was the first one she'd ever caught, you know. So good for her. I'm going around there to practice. We were fixing to go to the water. I wanted her to practice sight casting and stuff. And she got to Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's probably, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, later on, I'll show you one I know a weight on. Um, the spotted gar, it's, you can identify it because it'll usually have spots all over it. That's not necessarily a 100% guarantee because some of the other ones will sometimes have spots on them too. Like even a long nose gar will sometimes be spotted up. Um, it's more located, a little more centralized, but again, Louisiana is a, is a focal point for it. 
And then the final one is the short nose gar, and it's again uh, got a you know focus of Louisiana area. So all of my not all of it, but most of my experience gar fishing is all along this corridor of the Mississippi River and in the areas that are influenced by the river. So it's everywhere from down the bottom, Thompson Creek, up to um, the Fancy Point Towhead, which is not the Fancy Point, but the St. Maurice Towhead, which is that island you see kind of right in the middle, that area uh, just below Cat Island. And then over in the far top left corner, um, Old River. So I, I do a lot of it up there too. But all these areas are connected to the river, so they're constantly changing with the uh, rise and fall of the river all year long. The river is like a, a biomass highway for, for these things. Um, and in this uh, area, though, you find them in all kinds of water, like on the left, that's a long nose gar I caught this a week and a half ago in uh, Bayou Serra. It was like crystal clear water, real pretty stuff. The fish in the middle was um, was um, in the the Gar Alley. It's just a canal that drains Cat Island. And then the the short nose gar on the far right was uh, out at Old River. For tackle, um, I've found the setup that works best is like an eight weight to a 10 weight rod. Um, reels, it doesn't really matter. Um, click and pull, I've got click and pull reels, I got disc drag reels, whatever. Um, any of it'll work. Um, Lines, I use weight forward floating lines, and then I have some uh, sinking lines that I'll use, but mostly it's all just weight forward floating. Um, the leader setup, I use like a, a, an IGFA uh, setup just to make it sporting. Um, the, the butt section will be um, 40 pound mono, and then I'll go down to a, a 15 pound class tippet. Uh, which has to be at least 15 inches and then I'll do it back to a 40 pound shot tippet which is 12 inches max. The only reason I do that is so if you get up on a, a big one um, you know and it gets wrapped up in its around its bill or in its mouth or something it's not going to just wear through it real quick you know it'll have some uh, endurance to it um, but I, I find 15 pound if you tie knots well and all that, it, it takes a lot of force to break 15 pound leader. Um, you, can, you can really uh, bear down on them hard. I, um, just a week and a half ago in Bayou Serra, and they, the day that little, that little clip there was showing um, of that long nose gar, I hooked up on a really large one and um, was pulling it in hard enough. It, it eventually got off. Um, but when I checked the fly, I mean, I was pulling it hard enough to bend the hook. And, you know, that was just on 15 pound leader. So you can put a lot of force on that, that size test. Do you, uh, I mean, does the drag come into play often? Do you get them on the reel or do you kind of just? Um, I only get on the reel on the biggest of fish. Mm -hmm. um, I'll explain that in just okay. a second. For um, flies, I use all um, large articulated trout flies like that are tied for brown trout. Um, it's all uh, you know stuff like this. Um, these kind of things. They're they're all tandem hook. Usually it's like a size two hook. Um, some of them have dumbbell eyes weighting them. Uh, it's, the patterns are, it's like a circus peanut. Um, uh, they're, they're all the Kelly Gallup stuff, so they're all inappropriately named, but um, you know, it's a monkey, I'm missing the word of it, uh, a dungeon, 
if you're missing a word out of it. <laughs> a, um, a bang tail. Um, well, actually, this is a flugen zombie. And then this one here that's not weighted at all is a, is a bang tail TNA. Um, the, the rope fly theory behind all this. Um, when I first started out doing it, I, I was doing, you know, using these types of flies, if you want to call them that. And, and the, the theory behind it is the, all this, it's just a piece of nylon rope and you just unravel it and tease it all out. And when the gar bites it, um, it'll all floss up in all its teeth and it'll get stuck on there and then you've got it ensnared by the teeth and then you um you pull it in um it it was um it's effective and it, and it works um so I, I the first ones i tried i actually it was like this one where it, it's tied on a regular hook shank but i cut the hook off of it so it's just completely hookless fly then I tried some like on the left there where it had a hook just in case uh, something else came along and wanted it. And then, you know, I had some success with this setup. So, so one day I came up with an idea. I was like, you know what, I'm going to tie up this real abomination of a fly that had a trailing treble stinger on it. And it was incredibly effective. <laughs> but incredibly scary to cast around and all that with this <laughs> treble hook on it and um, Daniel and I we messed with it a little bit not a whole lot and you know, caught some fish with it. It, it but at the end of the day it really um, it, it wasn't my thing it was more like you're kind of grappling them by the mouth with the with the treble um, so to floss or not to floss um, I don't do it like this at all anymore. Um, they don't cast well at all. You know, and once they get wet and stuff, it's just like a big floppy mess. Um, they're not any fun to tie. You know, it's just a piece of rope lashed to a hook, and then you can try to dress it up and make it look like a fly if you want. You don't have to. Um, but the real reason why I don't do it is what I found is when they when they bite this stuff, they don't really they don't really seem to have any sense of urgency. And um, the way I can best demonstrate that is if someone would like to volunteer to hold it like in one hand, hold this rope fly, and hold this double hook flugen zombie zombie tightly in their other hand, and let me set the hook on both of them and tell me which one get your attention better <laughs> and what I, what I found was when you're fishing hooks on them when you when you set that hook a real hook they fight a whole lot differently and they, they're, they're definitely more desperate to get away and, and all that so I exclusively only fish legitimate flies that, that are hooked um, it's, it's a little harder so the, the technique of how to do it, there's, there's a couple different scenarios we'll cover. One of them is the, the sight casting, and that's the classic gar fishing scenario. Everyone's seen it, because I mean, these things are all over the place where they're either just sitting there floating like a log in the water, or they um, come up and you see them at the surface briefly. So whenever you see that, what you want to do is cast as close as you can to the side to the side of the fish's head um, and when I say close it's not like cast a foot away if you can put it two inches away from its head the better you know that these things don't really spook that that easy um, they can sometimes but for the most part that they, they won't um, but put it right next to its head and ideally if you can put it kind of right like if it's, if it's lined up like this and it's eyeballs kind of right here, if you can land the fly right here, just a little bit behind its eye, where it's gonna come moving right by the side of its head, 
probably 90 plus percent of the time that fish is gonna, when it sees it, it's gonna make a very rapid sideways swipe at the fly almost every time. And um, as soon as it does that and you feel that, that tension, then don't, don't lift the rod or you know, don't trout set on it or anything. The, what I found to, to bring you the most success at that point is when you're, when you're fishing these things, when you cast to them out there, get your rod tip down in the water to where you have a, long, a, a straight line to the fish. And as soon as it hits it, strip set it hard. Don't move the rod, just strip set it hard as you possibly can. And when, it's, when you feel that it's stuck on there, you can put a little bit of bend in the rod, but you keep that, you know, the, the, the most force you can keep on it is keeping a straight line to it. So you can put a little bit of bend if you want. I mean, you kind of a natural tendency will, will do that. But then proceed to just keep stripping it in as hard as you can. Don't give it any like little playroom, you know, don't do the Orvis pose with your rod and put a big old bend in it and all that. If you do that, it's going to throw the hook just about every time because when it gets a little bit of slack and a little slack on that pressure, the hook's coming out. Um, so just get it and start pulling it in as hard as you can. And if it's a big enough fish and it turns and runs on you, then you know, feed it the line and you can get it on the reel. Otherwise, you're probably going to pull most of them in by hand. Um, now, there is an exception to this. Sometimes you can set the hook hard enough to drive it through the bone and all that. And once you do that, you he didn't get them anywhere. You got them at that point. So then you can, you know, do whatever you want with the rod. So you're saying usually you just have them hooked in the teeth or something? Yeah. It'll be in the teeth or just the point of the hook will just be stuck, just stuck on the bone and just hanging on like that. So as soon as any tension is released, it will just pop off? A lot of times, yeah. 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 Uh, blind casting, it's, it can be sh shockingly effective. I've caught just as many blind casting as I have sight casting. However, to be successful at it, you got to find an area with like what I call high gar density. So it's got to be a lot of gar around. You know, if it's just one gar in the in the river there rolling one time and you know, you're probably not going to have much luck. But if you're, you come across a spot where they're just all over the place rolling, then the, the trick I found then is to just make as long a cast as you can. You know, if that's 40 feet, fine. If it's 50, if you can make an 80 foot cast, make an 80 foot cast out into the area where they're all hanging out. And then just start stripping the fly back in. Get your rod tip down in the water, have a straight line to it, and then you just you have to you have to really feel for it because sometimes they'll hit it and they'll hit it hard. Other times it'll just be like a subtle, a real subtle little bump, almost to the point where you you'll think you just hit something in the water. But it it'll it'll be one. Um, and the the more you do it, the more you'll pick up like how many times you're actually getting hit and you know not realizing as soon as you feel that hit it's the same thing as a side fish and uh, strip set it as hard as you can and if you when you feel that tension just keep keep reefing on it and and bring it in you know don't don't give it an inch So I just make a long cast and then get a, a low rod down in the water. Um, this scenario has played out more than once for me to the point that it's, it, you know, it's worth sharing. If you make your cast out there and you're stripping it back in and you feel that little bump and then that's it and you keep on coming cast, make the exact same cast again and bring it through that exact same spot again. And then when you get to that same spot and if you feel that bump again, um, and, you know, nothing happens after that and you're like, ah, oh, that's just a, like a log or something down there. Make, go for a third cast. 
And on that third cast, when you hit that spot and you feel that bump, strip it as hard as you possibly can because you're either going to bury it so deep in a log that you're going to have to cut the line <laughs> off or, or what I've repeatedly found, you're about to be hooked up on a really big one. And, um, and at that point, back to the same old thing that we've already talked about, just start fighting it, fight it hard and aggressive. That, that's, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, if you're fishing a, a location with, with high guard density, then you, you have a really good chance of getting hits and all that. But the reality of, of gar fishing is um, it's hard to, to actually land them, um, to, to get, a, you know, get it set in their mouth uh, well enough to get it all the way to the boat or to the shore or wherever you're fishing from you know, and actually get it in the net or get it in the hand. It, it's a real challenge. So when, when you when you pull it off, you've actually kind of accomplished something because they're 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 hard to stay hooked up on. They they jump, they shake, they do all kinds of stuff. They'll try to make little runs and all that. Um, if you do get one like legit hooked, which which will happen, then. You definitely want to have some pliers with you. Remember that before you go try to do all this because after, if you're out there and you don't have them, then putting your fingers in there to try to get the hook out is uh, an interesting proposition, to say the least. I, I use these so you know I'm able to get in there and um, uh, grab the hook and, and get it out. But if, if you get one that's really hooked, you, you're probably going to lose your fly in the process of getting it out. It's, it's hard to get them loose without tearing the fly all up. It's just part of it. Um, and then on the other flip side of it, like I was saying earlier, where it's just a hook point, it's just kind of poking them a little bit. Um, a lot of times when you get them to the net and you put the slack on the leader, it'll just, the hook will just fall right out of their mouth at that point. So you're using bar hooks. Mm -hmm. Landing them, um, most of them, you know, like we use different techniques, just like a, a net. Um, I don't think I've ever tried to just like reach down and, and grab one out of the water. Um, you know, uh, scoop up in a net. The the thing on the the left side there, that fish is was about a. Well, the, it's a net I made out of a piece of poultry fencing and some PVC, and the point of it was to be able to scoop up the bigger ones and then kind of subdue them on the boat because when they get in the boat, they can go nuts and start flopping all over their place and tear up your fishing rods and everything else. Um, so that, but that's a 48-inch net. So that fish was, it went from stem to stern all across the net. Um, you're not going to get bit by one, you know, they, they're not like trying to bite or anything like that, but if you do brush your hand up against the teeth and all, <coughs> it is going to likely to cut you, so be careful with them. They are, um, they are awkward to handle, um, you know, they're long, they're strong, and they get to try and gyrate all around and all that. and they all have a, a unique, there's like it's just a unique gar odor. If you've ever caught one, you'll know it, what I'm talking about. There's just this unique smell to them. And they have this ability to emit this slime out of them that is just incredible. It's like just snot coming out of them. Um, it's pretty, pretty nasty. Um, gets all over the place. You can do it. I mean, anyone can. I mean, they're all over the place. It's, it's very obtainable, you know, different sizes of them. Um, the, the top left corner up there, I decided I wanted to try some, like make some fish cakes out of them or garballs. So I brought those two home. Um, 
Someone was asking about like weight of the fish. Those are the only ones I've ever actually weighed. These are the ones on the tailgate of the truck. The top one was a 36 inch long nose guard and it weighed 10 pounds. And the other one was a 34 incher and it weighed eight pounds. If you're gonna clean one, if you've ever done that before or not, it's quite an interesting experience. Um, I did it by using a pair of channel locks to hold the dorsal fin and then taking a large knife and going along the, the back or along the top and basically peeling off this uh, one inch strip. And then you can take your fillet knife and go, um, you know, kind of peel the skin back from the, from the fillet of sorts. It's, it comes out more like a big back strap, like a deer. It's a big old long chunk of meat. It doesn't have any fishy smell to it at all. It doesn't have the consistency of like regular flaky fish. It's a little thicker, more like a maybe chicken or something. It's a great substitute if you want to make crab with a K or something like that. Um, or grind it up for uh, fish cakes, which is what I did. Um, what I learned from the experience was if you're going to do it, it needs to be at least a 10 pounder because it's a lot of work to get into it. And if it's you know any smaller than that, then it, I don't know if it's worth the effort to clean one. Also, what happens when you're out doing this stuff is um, you catch all the, the friends of the gar, all the other well-known trash fish of Louisiana are all hanging out in the same water setup called gas for goo and shoe pick and uh, the big catfish and, and the bass. Uh, I caught that bass that same day I was telling the story where uh, Daniel's wife went and caught that fish when the water went black water. He, he was just sitting there right up against the bank just hanging out and basically cast a fly into its mouth and caught it. Um, Any questions? Maybe, maybe you're saying you have a double hook on the, mm -hmm. on the flies. Which hook do you usually catch it? Or is it, just it can be fish? both. Sometimes it's the front hook, sometimes it's the back hook. Um, the, the theory behind why I went to this was because a lot of what I'm doing is, is blind casting or casting to where gar were immediately present, like where they rolled. And it was to put something that was really large in the water that had a big profile, so they'd be more likely to see it and go after it. And then being very large and having the two hooks, if they snapped on it like in the middle, you were gonna get them with the back hook or if they went for the head of it, you'd get them on the front hook. It's just kind of the increase your odds of, of getting one of the hooks in them. I used to uh, go down to Rockville, and the guys would fish gar fish. They fish those alligator gars down there, and they would catch those huge guys. I mean, they were like 50, 70 pound gar fish. Mm -hmm. These were about that big around. And what they would do with their gizmo was that they had some kind of a loop where when they cast it out there, now they had it, it was baited, so it wouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. But when they pulled on it, the, the thing would slip out between their teeth, and it couldn't come out because it was, it was like a lasso with their teeth in between. Mm -hmm. Is, is it legal to tie a fly with that kind of a gizmo? I'm not sure he would buy it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's legal or not. I guess it's not snagging. No. I, don't, I think you could make an argument that it's not snagging, but uh, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not giving you legal <laughs> advice on what you can and can't do from, from that perspective. I mean, that might not even be legal. <laughs> that might not even be legal at all. Yeah, I mean, for me, that, that falls in the, the bucket of like doing this kind of stuff, you know, with the rope things. And, and it's just not, that's just not my way of doing it. I, I have my own little set of standards that I go by. I don't care if you want to fish rope flies or whatever. I'm not going to think any thing. less of you, but. But I, I like to do it with, yeah. you know, real hooks and, you know. Your 10-pounder looks like it'd be more edible than a 50-pounder. 
It may be. I don't know. I don't know how much mercury is in a 50-pound gar. <laughs> you might be able to tell the temperature with it when you catch it. Side carfish oh, at that right there at the mouth of Blind River in Lake Marble. It was a huge deal. Was like four or five hundred pounds, I want to say, but like a lot of people shooting with bows and arrows, yeah. you know, in Little Alabama, Big Alabama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, you had mentioned uh, a forty pound tournament window the on your on your program. Uh -huh. uh, I just I'm familiar with like a smaller tarpon. Uh -huh. Central America, places like that, I fish some that yeah. a lot of guys just fish to a stream or something like that for tarpon up to 40, 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. And they just run seven foot of straight 40 pound floor carpet. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't be at a, at a disadvantage doing something like that, I guess. Huh? No, no, not, not at all. I, um, I just run a class tippet. It's not that I would, you know, I. Even if I call it one that would be a, a record fish, I would likely would just put it back in the water and not worry about it. Um, it's too much of a hassle to deal with that. But I, I like to fish the, the, the class tippet just to know that I did it on a 15 pound or 12 pound leader. You probably, you probably already have bought a record fly fishing. Yeah, I have on a short nose, I know that. Um, what was that? Not on a, a, I think the record on 20 pound uh, class for like an alligator gar is like 80 something pounds, fly oh, fishing. Yes. Oh, and um, out of the, I think it was in the Trinity River in Texas. And uh, the long nose gar, I think on 20 pound is like a 50 pound fish. Wow. Now, I, I've seen them, you know, where I'm fishing, they're there. <coughs> um, all, all of them. Um, the challenge I have for myself is to, is to do the, well, I mean, I made it up, but the Louisiana Gar Slam where you get all four species in one day on fly and on a class tippet. So I think, I, I think I've got the place to do it. And it's just doing it. It's not going to be easy to... Because it's not like you go along and you're like, oh, well, here's the spotted one, and here's the short nose one, and all that. You know, it's it's going to be hard. It would be quite an accomplishment for anybody to, to pull that off, you know, in one day, um, and to land them all and, and doc, uh, document. It's got to be documented. Document, yeah, right? I don't want to hear anyone tell me they oh. did it. You can't show me some photos of it, and, all that. and then it doesn't count, and then you'd be time stamped too. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Yeah. On the cold, you can't get there except with a kayak or a boat. Yeah. Because the park is close to it. But the crabbing pond, well, there's Yeah, I know we're talking about where the fish cleaning pond. table is in there. Huh? Where the fish cleaning table yeah. is or used but to be. If you go out to the far end of the island yeah. from the crab pond, you go across that rock jetty, and you're in that cove where the tide comes in. Yeah. On the Barataria side. And there's fish in there five and six feet long. Yeah. Some of them even look there now. It's like fish this big around. Yeah. Oh, they were there Saturday. I yeah, I don't know what the head over there is. I'm going to take them all off now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, the only problem, like, you know, you, you can find the, the bigger alligator gar. You know, they, they tolerate the, the salinity and all that, so you can find them down in the marsh when you're out red fishing and all that. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of, unless you all know the secret honey hole, you know, it's been kind of hit and miss coming across them in my experience down there. And every now and then you'll find one, but it's not consistent enough that I would go gar fishing for them there. Um, I, I would focus more on the kind of the areas that I'm at that are impacted by the Mississippi River or the maybe like in the basin area. Um, or I don't down. understand they, but they spawn in areas that are like flooded grasslands or something. So they, they do. They they, they, a... they spawn off, um, at Old River back in early May. I went there and they weren't rolling a lot yet. And when I finally found them, it was the river was still up and the, the back areas were flooded. And you would find them paired up back there mm -hmm. spawning. Um, so I've seen them doing their business like that. And I've also come across in the back flooded areas um, in the Cat Island area and found like the little, the little fry oh, wow. swimming around and all that. Um, it kind of shocked me when I saw it. And I was like, look at that, a little, little baby gar swimming around here. Yeah, that's what you ought to be trying to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the next chance. If I can knock off the slam, then it'll be uh, a fry slam. You gotta get all four of them in the larval stage, Sydney. How's that? <laughs> all right, now you know everything I know about it. Um, to, to get to that point, it took uh, hours and hours and hours of uh, Flinging, flinging flies out there and figuring it out. Um, stripping, retrieving wise, it can sometimes it's fast. More often, it's just kind of a moderate speed. But I've also had it where you strip along and get distracted and just let the fly sit there while you fiddle with whatever is distracting you. Then when you go back to it, there's a fish on it. So, you know, different things. It's hard to say what. Is the right technique? You just gotta adjust it and figure it out. So the four you, you have the four Louisiana species in your little ten wide challenge. Is that what you have right now? I have three of them. Three of them. Yeah, well, I except Ben ch has challenged one of them. So which, which I hope he's it? right because if he is, mm -hmm. it's the harder one for me to get. So it's the out. I have one listed as a spotted gar, and he has like a question mark on it. Oh. I'm like, oh, good. Um, tell me it's an alligator gar, <laughs> then I can, I, can, I can pick up a spotted gar pretty easy and buy you Sarah, so uh, I'll have them all at that point this year. Um, but that's not in one day, so it's not, that doesn't right, meet my, uh, oh, wait, okay. my aspiration. So, yeah, so, so what kind of, so fish in the Mississippi River and Bayou Sarah, a lot of times you're probably fishing dirty water, right? Is it well, I don't fish water? in the Mississippi River. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's too the, dirty. Um, the, the Bayou Sarah is going to be clean. Thompson Creek is going to be clean. Um, unless you're fishing it right after a big rainfall, um, then it's going to be all turbid for a couple of days till it settles back out. Okay, so you're targeting in the clear water and you're mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. So, what, what about colors? Like, like most colors, you, see, you find brighter colors or just depends on the days? So. Most of the ones that I've had good fortune with are kind of black and white pat color patterns. Um, some of that's the water's a little bit, you know, it, it, the water's usually got a good foot, 18 inches of uh, visibility on a, on a good garden day. Um, but I've had other chartreuse and other colors work too. I don't know how critical that is, you know, that, if you put something right next to them, they'll they'll snap at it usually. What, what, what material does that fly? Um, the black and white fly. What, what which one? This one? Yeah. Uh, this is called a flugen zombie. It's um it's marabou, marabou on the tail, and the the back body is um we call it a complex twist. You basically tie in two hackles, and a um. You call that stuff, Brian? That uh, uh, the sparkly like stuff. Palmer chenille or Palmer chenille, something like that. Something like polar chenille. Polar chenille, yeah. and a piece of polar chenille, and then you tie that all in. Then you spin it 
and twist it and it'll basically make like a dubbing brush and you kind of tease it then you just palm it around the hook then um then on the front hook it's it's again it's the exact same thing until you get to the head then the head is just that um laser dub laser dub yeah it's just laser dub you just tie it in like stack it like you're kind of doing deer hair but it doesn't really do what deer hair does and so it's just a laser dub head and you tie some legs in i'm gonna do uh, one of the tie-in nights i don't know if it's my own yeah, we gotta reschedule it, yeah. yeah i'm gonna yeah. do an articulated fly um i don't know if i'll do the fluke and zombie it depends on you know, if people want to do something none of them are hard to tie but they kind of got a little more complicated steps to them if you've never if you're not real experienced at tying flies um so we might do this one it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. or um the circus peanut is a real simple one it's basically the they're all very similar. It's basically the same thing until you get up to the head, then it's just like cactus chenille wrapped around to make the head. The the sex dungeons are um, a deer hair head with um, dumbbell eyes in it. They all kind of create a, a fly that will sink, but would also be a little bit neutrally buoyant. If you just let them do their thing, they will keep sinking, but they're not gonna just like torpedo straight to the bottom clouds or something will. Like the, my old river spots are mostly in about, I don't know, Daniel, what, eight feet of water probably, but um, you're only fishing in the top 18, 20 inches of water. You know, the gar will all hit up there, up high. All right. Is there any limit or anything? You can catch any size gar, right? Yes, they're not, they're not a um, protected fish in Louisiana, which I think is a shame. Um, you know, I would like to see them be protected, have a, a limit on them or something. Just, uh, um, yeah, they get a bad, they get a bad rap and get blamed for eating all the bass and crappie. Um, it's probably more people that just don't know how to catch bass and crappie than, <laughs> than are eating all of them. Um, frankly, yeah, they, they feed more on shad. So unless you're a diehard shad eater, um, they're probably not eating your fish. <laughs> so. Very incredible. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for having me.